All right, good morning. It's always morning. Um, in the last video, basically, I established, we established that we survive, we live past the point of death. Our consciousness, whatever that is, exists past that point. So the next question for me is, does whatever that is, our consciousness, our soul, does it exist before we're born? Um, or does it all kind of come into existence at birth? That is, uh, that is what I'm going to get into this. Into, that's what I'm going to talk about in this video, basically. So reincarnation. Um, I have done some research on this. I'd like to do more. But where I started was a book called Life Before Life by Jim B. Tucker, MD. And that was written in 2008, I believe. He is from the um, University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies. That was a good book. So I listened to that on Audible. And um, that uh, is kind of a lot of that and some of the other research that I, that I have taken, you know, that I've read from this um, University of Virginia, from their division there. <laughs> That's what I'm going to kind of talk about in this video. So they basically um, have over 2,500 past life memory cases in children. And this, uh, this division was basically started by, um, started by and led by Dr. Ian Stevenson. He did 50 years of research on this topic, uh, published 300 papers, and wrote 14 books on reincarnation. Now, I would love to go through all that. I have not, obviously. Um, but here's what I've learned, and um, I will post also the links to this stuff and some of these links to different books and things in the comments, or not in the comments, in the um, description below. So if you want to check that out, check that out later. But here's really, I'm just going to summarize basically what I've learned and kind of my conclusions on it to this point, and uh, just my thoughts. So number one, young children, age two to four, they remember past lives they have these memories these memories are verified these memories are often of you know the all kinds of details specific details the way that they died um the location obscure things too um and they you know researchers will will go back into these places and into history and these details will be they be true they'll they'll be able to verify these things um these kids will have memories of people in photos that you know they've never met before that they shouldn't know and they turn out to be what their memories are is actually real. Um, they, these children have memories of things that only the former per, the person in the former life knew about. Um, for example, there's one child who was taken to the place of, of the, the past life existence, right? And um, they were able to dig up like a kind of like a small, um, kind of like secret hidden uh, place where the, the person in the former life had, had hid something that nobody else knew about, about except for that person. So there's, there, there's a lot of these cases, right? These are very young children. Number two, these children sometimes have memories of things that happened while they were in their mother's womb, and those were later verified. Um, so for example, a child maybe, you know, is in the womb, is born, and then starts saying they have memories of things that happened between the mother and the father conversations or actions that took place and the kids have a memory of it, but they were in the womb when this happened. And then it's verified later that, okay, well that actually did happen. Um, some t number three, sometimes children have memories of the past life. Okay. But also memories of in between lives. So the, this is more rare and obviously is more speculative, right? But they have, um, basically a memory of the past life. Then some of the children have a memory of, you know, dying and what wherever they were whatever they were doing uh between the last life right and that kind of middle period and then some of them have memories of being in the womb there was a story of um a a young child who had memories of being in the womb with their with their twin um basically and the twin ended up passing away and dying in the womb and um i mean all this stuff is in this book that i read you can you can actually check it out for yourself but basically so it's you know they have memories of the woman and they also you know the, the, then they'll relay these memories when they're into this next life supposing that that's how all this takes place um number four these children they identify with the previous person so it's not just like oh i have this memory like this kind of dream or this kind of thought or whatever 
they identify, right? They mem they have these memories. They 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 basically to the children, those are their own memories. It's not just some memory of something else. It's like this is my memory of who I was. Like this is me remembering me. So they identify with that person. They believe they are that person. So it's not just like, oh, I have a memory of some random person. It's like, no, I am that person. And they will often struggle to tell which life is the real life. So basically the two to four year old children, they'll be, you know, uh, living and interacting with different people. And, but they, you know, they might, they might speak of, uh, I mean, they, they might consider their, their previous parents to be their real parents and not their current parents, for example. They often will talk about, you know, the events leading up to the death in their former life, but um, they'll speak of the past life in the present tense. And so for them, they, they often, these children actually, actually often have a very hard time differentiating, like, which is, which is the real life that they're currently living in. Um, number five, they'll often have the same kind of quirks and likes and dislikes and phobias, fears of the person of the former life. Um, these phobias often are related to the cause of death. Um, they also develop, uh, philias. So basically things that they like and they're like, or that they want, like are addicted to cravings. They often will want, um, different food or clothing than their present culture. Um, they'll want like the, the food or they want to dress in a way that was analogous to their former life. So there was one story of a kid who the former life would have been in like a, higher caste society, right? Like in a higher um, class and they were born into like a lower class. So they had, they couldn't function well in the lower class because they were, they only wanted to eat food that was like in the higher class or they only wanted to wear clothes that was like in the, like there's, there's things like that that pop up. Um, also addictions. So if the person in the former life that they identify with uh, was addicted to alcohol or tobacco or things like that, these children will have cravings for those things at a very young age. So now getting into number six, this is the really interesting thing. So children actually have birthmarks. These children that supposedly are reincarnated have birthmarks that correspond to the previous life that match severe injuries, wounds, things like that, especially things that were related to the cause of death or conditions that severely impacted their former life. And these birthmarks are attached to the embryo, right? This comes from, this is not just like it popped up when they were, you know, one, two years old. It's like from birth, from the embryo, they, they have these birthmarks um, and they're analogous to the, the former memory. So if like, if a young child has memories of a past life, believes they are this person in this past life and that past, that person in the past life died from, you know, being shot right in the chest with a shotgun or something then they'll be born with a birthmark of like scars and markings where the, um, the shotgun maybe penetrated and killed the person. And maybe they'll have an exit right on the back, on their backside as well. And it'll basically match up to the, the former life. And this, these birthmarks, they have been verified and studied. And there's actually a whole book that was written again by Dr. Ian Stevenson did a ton of research on this. Um, and you can actually, you can look at this stuff. So um, let's get into, let's see, number seven. So sometimes the um, the actual gender is of the children is different than their former life. So they will have a difficult time adjusting. Like if they were a female in the former life, they're, they're, they will have a difficulty adjusting to being a boy in, in the, right? And then so that shows up as well, shows up in how they want to dress um, some children that were a different gender in the former life will refuse to dress, um, you know, like if, if they were male in the former life, they will refuse to dress like a female in the current life or vice versa, right? Something like that. And in their behavior, what things they like to do or play, um, play with, like uh, what kind of toys they like to play with, um, activities they like to do, that shows up as well. Um, number eight, they also have similar abilities or talents that they did in the previous life that will show up. Number nine, this is really interesting. So in some cases, there will be a foreshadowing, like almost like a prophetic, prophetic dream um, of the formerly deceased person kind of announcing that they'll return. So for example, if a, um, if a person dies in a family and um, then, you know, some other family member has a dream that, that, that 
that grandmother, whoever it was, passed away is, is basically has a dream of them, right? And that in the dream, they would be saying like, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm coming back, I'm going to see you soon. And then that mother gives birth to a child and the child identifies with and believes that they are that former family member, has memories of the former family, family member, verifies um, details of the former life. Like that, that it also happens. Um, this maybe not as common, but it does happen. Um, and number 10, this is not just localized. Um, this is a worldwide phenomenon. There are more cases identified though in regions that are more open to the idea of reincarnation culturally, which makes sense, right? Um, maybe here in the US, like it's not really like a, a common belief, maybe so much that people reincarnate. And, you know, so maybe people, if it, if their child does start kind of having these, you know, memories and things and brings it up, maybe it's, it's probably more likely that they would, um, you know, it would just kind of, it wouldn't be taken as seriously. Whereas in a culture that does accept that idea, um, then obviously it's more likely for that to be documented and, and looked into. So that's just something else to note. Um, now, to get into my thoughts on all this, before I do that, there is one, uh, just so that you can kind of see an example of a case that's pretty, com that's pretty um, not common, uh, pretty well known. There's a boy named James who, he basically had memories of being a fighter pilot from World War II. That's a um, pretty well-known case. I put the link to it. You can basically just, um, this is just a random YouTube video that you can watch, um, kind of like a short little summary of his story, just so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. There are tons of these stories. Like I said, this um, Division of Perceptual Studies, there are 2,500 cases of children all around the world that you know are being studied. It's probably more now. But um, to summarize, you have children that are being born that have verified memories of the past, of the past life, and even in the womb, um, they identify with that past life, meaning that they believe they are that person and confuse the present reality with the past life and vice versa. Their interests, emotions, fears, cravings will match the person of the past life. So that is carried over. And they will have physical birthmarks that match the person of the past life in terms of their wounds, uh, injuries, or um, basically, yeah, wounds in terms of how they died, right? Okay, so there are basically three different options to make sense of all of this that I've presented so far. Obviously, something not purely physical is going on. I, I think that's where you start. Um, and so here, here are three, three conclusions. Um, and this is taken from that book that I mentioned there where I, where I learned a lot of this from. So number one, this could be possession by some other consciousness or the consciousness of the deceased. Um, however, I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense when you consider, you know, the fact that these children have matching birthmarks. Um, you would be you basically, it would have basically the possession would have to make sense of that, um, to, to kind of be a viable explanation. Number two, you could say that this is extrasensory perception. So basically these children are psychic and that's how they, you know, they have some form of psychic ability and that's how they, um, have these memories. I, that's possible, but, um, again, you have to, the, how does that explain the matching birthmarks? And how does it explain the fact that these children identify um, as the deceased person? Um, you have to you have to consider those two things, right? And then the third option, number three, is that this is indeed reincarnation in the traditional sense. Um, and I think that, I mean, it's it's definitely possible, right? When we think about like the last video I made talking about people who die, leave their body, have an experience, see the world around them, come back into their body. Um, if they died and their consciousness left their body and it came back in, then that already shows us, okay, it is possible for a non-physical consciousness to enter a physical body. So that automatically would say, okay, reincarnation is p possible in that sense. Um, I would say as well, extrasensory perception and spiritual entities, whether those are human or, or not human, I think that is real. Um, of course, I haven't made a video on you on that on yet on that. I can't um, necessarily prove that, but I have had personal experiences with those things. 
Um, I think many people do. Um, so that's something I'll probably make a video on later. But there are other things just beside this, besides this um, evidence and stuff that I've kind of presented in, um, today that should be considered. Um, number one is, is work on uh, past life regressions by hypnotherapists. So these are people like Dolores Cannon. Um, there's another guy who wrote a book called Journey of Souls. And what you find with these people who do hypnotic regressions is that they, they do thousands, hundreds and thousands of these um, regressions with people through hypnosis where they you know, have these memories um, during hypnosis of their past lives. And what's interesting is that, uh, you know, out of all the hundreds and thousands of people that, that they've worked with, they are all telling a very similar story and bring up very similar things and very similar themes and uh, very similar experiences. And so that kind of, that's something that I, I think needs to be considered and looked into more. Um, I will want to do more research on that later. Uh, and the second thing is that people who have uh, after-death experiences, like we discussed before, they, in their after-death experience, when they are separated from their physical body, they will come to understand that they have lived multiple other lives. Um, they'll find out through that experience in that other dimension that, um, that that's a, a common thing. And they'll often ex kind of describe uh, their experience as kind of like remembering. When they're on the other side, they, they feel like that's their true home. That's where they've come from. That's where they've always been. And they're just kind of remembering it all. And they're like, like uh, they're returning to where, where they originally came from. That's a very common theme in uh, near-death experiences. And um, that's, that's another thing to, to consider um, that I think kind of gives a little bit more credence to, you know, the reincarnation in the traditional sense as the explanation for, for all of this. Now, where do I fit all this? Um, I've got my three boxes, like I, like I explained before, right? Which boxes this fit in? Does it fit into the provable box, the high evidence box, or the, you know, kind of 50, 50 still speculative box? I think this fits into the middle. I don't think I can, you know, we can prove at least not where I'm at in my research so far. I don't think I can say like, this is something that, you know, is provable, but I do think that there is a high degree of evidence for reincarnation. Um, and I would put it in the middle box. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at now. So what are the implications from this? What questions should we be asking, uh, you right about this topic now? So if reincarnation is true, my first question is, does everyone reincarnate or only some people? Um, I mean, we already know that at death, the soul leaves the body and in those cases it returns to the body. So the soul can enter into a physical body from the outside. Um, we know that. If reincarnation is true, this begs the question, when was our consciousness created, um, right? Was it created long before we entered into these bodies um, or are we eternal, right? If, if, if reincarnation is true, are we eternal or were we um, created at some point before entering into physical existence? Now, uh, the last thing I want to go over in this video is just uh, briefly, just the Christian view. What is the Christian view of reincarnation? Um, you know, for me, this is kind of significant because uh, I'm coming from a kind of a fundamentalist Christian background and, you know, having questioned my entire faith and um, I'm still struggling through what I what I believe on that topic. I mean, I, in my in my view, a fundamentalist Christian opinion of this research would be that, you know, Christian theology does not allow for reincarnation. Um, in Hebrews, it says that man is once to die and then comes judgment. So basically the idea is that when we're born, God creates us, uh, we're born as sinners uh, with a sin nature. And then if we don't place our faith in Christ to reconcile ourselves to God, some, at some time in this life that on the other side of death, the only thing really waiting for us is separation from God. Is, is And that's what I think you know the Bible would describe as hell, is, is separation, conscious eternal torment um, in hell. So I am, uh, and you can go to, uh, you can, I mean, you can look up what it says in Romans, Romans and Paul, what he teaches in, in that section of scripture is very clear on this. Um, I am not right now making any judgments about what I believe about Christian theology at this time, but it's obvious to me that reincarnation does conflict with Christian theology in that sense. So I would also put forward though, that Jesus himself, according to the scriptures, incarnated into a human body. So that's something to, to keep in mind there. So guys, I really, I hope that this uh, video was helpful. 
Um, I hope that you learned something. I'm certainly learning a lot. And um, I think uh, I think my next video is I'm going to have to start getting into some of my own personal experiences um, as I continue my research and just kind of um, describing those to you guys. So you have like more of an idea of, uh, of, of things that I have I have seen in my own life that uh, that have caused me to to both question and um, and dig a lot deeper. So happy new year again um, if you're just seeing this video and uh, I hope that you guys have a great one.